Deion Sanders went out and grabbed himself one of the best wide receiver rooms in all of college football. But how much is that worth in 2024? You are Locked On Buffs, your daily podcast on the Colorado Buffaloes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Buffs. I am your host, Kevin Borba. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. We are also brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day for free and available wherever you get your podcast who doesn't love free things and who doesn't love pfs max chadwick max how are you doing i'm doing great kevin thanks for uh so much for having me on again man yeah no problem we're we're here to talk about your rankings because they cause quite a stir um i believe you were what was the word you were called oh it was a good one oh uh some guy said i was ridiculous and outrageous he's and, ridiculous uh, and, and outrageous yeah. max chadwick pfs very own um, <laughs> we're gonna be talking about his wide receiver rankings because unlike most people in college football I feel like Max kind of understands that Colorado can, in fact, improve and that there is a lens where you don't have to look at like through the craziness where it's like, oh, Colorado is going to win it all. Or they're going to be terrible. Right. And Max actually put his top 10 receiver groups together and Colorado was in that top 10. And walk me through it. What stands out to you? Um, how much do they improve? Like, wh why do you rank them as highly as you do? Yeah, I think they did a great job in the transfer portal this offseason, right? Adding a couple of big time receivers like Lejonte Wester from uh, from FAU, who had over a thousand yards, over eleven hundred yards actually uh, for FAU. Will Shepard from Vanderbilt, who I also really like, um, he had over nearly seven hundred yards for Vanderbilt this past season as well. And then obviously you bring back Travis Hunter, right? Who's the most versatile player in college football? Um, will probably be the number one receiver and the number one corner for the Buffaloes this upcoming season. Uh, he had over 700 yards in just nine games uh, this past year. Um, you bring back other guys too, like like Jimmy Horn Jr., who had over 500 yards last year. Omarion Miller uh, had over 200 yards last year as well. Um, so yeah, I, I really like Colorado's receiving room. And I think obviously you have a uh, potential, not only potential, I think he will be a first round pick and Travis Hunter, who a lot of people think if he sticks to receiver could be a Pro Bowl caliber receiver in the NFL. I think he should stick to corner uh, personally, but um, you not only have him, but you have a guy who had over 1,100 yards last year in Wester. Will Shepard was a really, really solid receiver in the SEC as well. And then you bring back guys like Jimmy Horn Jr. and Amarion Miller too. Tight end spot is definitely a question mark right now. And obviously Sam Hart from uh, the transfer from Ohio State uh, is looking to hold that down and didn't really do anything at all for Ohio State. But uh, at receiver especially, uh, they should be in a really good spot next year in my opinion. Yeah, I think the, to touch on the tight end spot, I think it's honestly the tight end is going to be a six lineman, if the, if you will, because they brought in, like you said, Sam Hart. They brought in a kid from UNLV, none of which really played that much. And then they switched. And this might be a, a blast from the past. Savelle Smalls, former five star mm -hmm. edge. He yeah. is now playing tight end. And so it's like this whole they had one in Shamoma Mateo, but he ended up at Arizona State after just spending the spring with the buffs. And so I think this wide receiver group is going to have a lot of pressure on them in the passing game. And I also think it's going to be really interesting because the offense changed. And you could attest to this in a little bit. Last season, Sean Lewis's offense, it's fast. All the receivers, they run choice routes, so they're deciding what they're doing. Shador Sanders apparently did not like that. And so all of his receivers are kind of under his command now. And I think Shador doesn't get enough credit for how smart or savvy of a quarterback he is. So under his guidance, I think this room could really explode in the sense that he knows what he's looking for. And he can kind of help them know what they're looking for. So in terms of the receiver room and obviously Shador's strengths, how many wins do you think an elite group like this equates to? Like, obviously, it's not going to be nine wins just because of the receiver room. But realistically, like two to three, four to five. What do you think? Yeah, honestly, I, I think it's certainly at least like a, a few wins, right? Like three or four, maybe. And I think Colorado's probably going to be in a, in a spot where they're going to win five or six games probably next year, in my opinion. That's probably where I'd set the – and I, I think the over-under for them is five and a half right now. I think it's a pretty good over-under. Um, I might take that over. I think they will make a bowl game next year. But, yeah, I mean, you got an elite receiver room, right? And, and I mentioned the tight end spot's a question mark. But like you just said, I mean, they might legitimately be throwing out four receivers on every single play, whereas most teams have, you know, two starting outside receivers and a slot receiver and then a tight end. Colorado's probably going to have four wide, right? They're going to have two guys in the slot, two guys out wide. Because, uh, like I said, they have – four guys that can legitimately start and Hunter Wester Shepard and, and Jimmy Horn Jr. too. So 
Um, yeah, I think uh, it's a really good receiver room, and I think it's probably the biggest strength of Colorado, besides Shador Sanders. I think it's a top three quarterback in the country. It's probably the biggest strength of Colorado uh, besides quarterback uh, going into next year is, is that receiver room is really, really strong. And talk to me about, because obviously Colorado's returning to the Big 12. Um, obviously, none of these guys have played in the Big 12 before, but the, the school itself is. Talk to me about what fans should expect from the Big 12 secondaries, because I think the Big 12 – got a bad rep um, back in the day for not having any defense, which at, at times it didn't. But now it seems like the Big 12 is a lot more stout on defense. So what do you think will be the most challenging unit um, for this Colorado team and just what to expect in the Big 12, if you will? Yeah, so only one I, – I, my secondary rankings actually just dropped today, my final position unit ranking. Um, the only Big 12 team that cracked the top 10 was Arizona, um, who has Takario Davis, who's going to be a first-round pick, I think, at corner. Uh, Trey Dan Stukes is a really good uh, slot corner as well. Gunnar Maldonado is a really good safety. Uh, Colorado literally just missed. They were number 11 for me, so I think they have a really good mm -hmm. second as well. Uh, Kansas has a really good secondary. Uh, with Kobe Bryant there, Melo Dodson. I'm as to two, one of the best corner duos probably we have in college football now, so I was considering Kansas for that list as well. Uh, I think Iowa State has a really good secondary with Miles Purchase and uh, Jeremiah Cooper there and, and Malik Vernon there as well. Uh, so Iowa State was a, a school I was considering. Uh, Baylor actually surprisingly had a, had a pretty good secondary and I was looking at it. Uh, you have guys like Caden Jenkins, who's a true sophomore, had a really good year last year, a true freshman. Uh, Carl Williams, the fourth, another true sophomore who started for them last year. And again, really good year for them. Um, so those are some of the schools that are uh, have really good secondaries. But obviously it's not going to be like, say, the Big Ten or the SEC where you see a lot of elite secondaries. Um, it's more it, – there's some really solid ones, I would say. There, there aren't, like, elite ones right now. And, the only, like I said, the only one I consider to be top 10 is uh, is Arizona. Gotcha. Yeah, and Colorado, we talked about it. We've been teasing it. They have four high-quality receivers that, realistically, you plop them on a lot of programs. I'm not going to say every program, but you plop any one of those four at a different program, and they could be the number one guy. So you kind of, in a sense, have four number one guys running amok, and I think that could give a lot of secondaries trouble. I, I would assume you agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think they certainly do, right? And that's why they had a top 10 receiving core in the country, in my opinion. Because, like I said, they have four guys that uh, they're going to be throwing out there as starters, and I think they're all capable players, right? So, um, yeah, I think, they, like I said, they did a great job in the transfer portal, and they brought back a couple of their top receivers from last year and uh, Travis Hunter and Jimmy Horn. So, um, yeah, I think Colorado's receiving room is, like, like I said, definitely one of the biggest strengths of the team right now. Yeah, position group that I honestly didn't even realize they needed to upgrade, but they somehow managed to make it a lot better than last year's, which, I mean, you can't be mad at if you're Shador Sanders. And if you're Shador Sanders, you think you're an elite quarterback, you think you're a top pick, we're going to see what Max Chadwick thinks about Shador Sanders when we come back. But first, a word from our sponsors over at Game Time. Game Time makes getting NBA Finals tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. At game time, they have last minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever it is near you. They got the tickets. You can save even more with exclusive in app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. And you can even see where your seat is. So you should not be sitting behind a random pole or whatever it is. You know exactly what you're getting when you buy your tickets. And they have their lowest price guarantee um, where Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference if they don't have the lowest price. Take the guesswork out of buying NBA Finals tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College. That's L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back. We are talking about Shador Sanders. Obviously, he is a polarizing figure. I would say if he's not the best quarterback, he's definitely the most popular quarterback in college football right now. Um, he definitely, I think, has the most to gain. And Max Chadwick over here from PFF is going to tell us exactly where he thinks Shador ranks. You said in the top three. So if I had to guess, I would imagine he's two or three, not one, um, according to your rankings. But tell me why he's in the top three and tell me why he's not one right now. Yeah, I, I would put him number three right now um, in terms of college quarterbacks. Now, if you're talking right. NFL draft, I would put him probably number two behind Carson Beck. Uh, but in terms of just pure college quarterbacks, I think I would put Carson Beck from Georgia and Dylan Gabriel from Oregon uh, mm. above him right now as college quarterbacks. Again, not, not NFL prospects, it's college quarterbacks, because I want to make that clear. I don't think right, Dylan Gabriel right. is a, a great prospect. I think Shador is a much better prospect than, uh, than Dylan Gabriel is, which is why I think you know Shador is my number two quarterback in the draft at least. Uh, but what Shador does amazingly is that he's an advanced processor, man. I mean, he sees the game 
so well. I mean, you could tell that his dad's a former Hall of Famer, one of the greatest players to ever live, um, just by the way he sees the game, right? I mean, he's but this past year, when he was kept clean, which, again, was a rarity for Colorado last year, but when kept clean, he had the third best passing grade in the country, only behind uh, Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels. And those two were the first two picks in the NFL draft. So uh, w- from a clean pocket, Shore Sanders is the best returning passer in college football. Now, the biggest question, obviously, is going to be, can Colorado keep uh, him clean enough uh, for him to really show that even more uh, in, in his uh, final season for Colorado, most likely? But uh, he keeps the ball out of harm's way at an elite level. He had the fourth lowest turnover-worthy play rate uh, in the in college football as well. So, yeah, he just he, like I said, he just sees the game so well. He diagnoses coverages really well, uh, diagnoses defenses overall really well. Um, and I think he just does a really good job of finding open receivers and um, knowing where to go with the football. And, yeah, I, I think when he's kept clean, like I said, he, he's the best returning passer in the country. Yeah, and that bit, it's a big if last year. I think he was probably – pressured nine out of 10 times and he was i think the second most sacked quarterback in the country or the most sacked he was sacked over 50 times i think he was sacked as many or more than um than the two than his two seasons combined at jackson state so tough scene in boulder the first year around um i keep telling everybody and this is like a weird take i have max but you gotta hear me out on it i think he's kind of due for an even more of a breakout season you're probably like how is that even possible well let me explain the offensive line Obviously, a lot better. They brought in like 11 new guys. So hopefully there's five starters in there. You only need five to start. Hopefully 11 of one of the five of those 11, excuse me, can be someone who could protect him, can be someone who gives him the time. They have a hashtag that called um, don't touch two, which is kind of like the offensive lines mantra of don't letting people touch Shador Sanders. And then also the change in the offensive scheme. I teased it a little bit earlier. Pat Shermer comes in and he puts more of the the pressure, I guess you could call it or the decision-making on Shador rather than the receivers. And Shador said at the Super Bowl weekend, he wasn't the biggest fan of the offense they ran last year. So he has an improved offensive line. He has an offense that he prefers. And then he has a receiver room that you mentioned, top 10 in the country. I feel like we could see some record numbers from Shador. What what do you think of my sales pitch to you? <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, I think that's a, that's a good point. I think, yeah, there's certainly room for him to get better, right? I think there's, you know, even though he had a great year last year, and yeah, I thought he was a top 10 quarterback in the country probably. There's still a lot of, ways he can get better i think you know the offensive line gets blamed for a lot of of the pressures last year and i agree with that but at the same time he had a really high average time to throw he he don't he held onto the football for about 2.9 seconds every time which is the 17th highest in the power five um so and i think there's a lot of times where a lot of the sacks he took he took 49 sacks last year which were the most in the power five i I think a lot of them could also be attributed to uh to sanders and, and not to the offensive line so um i think you know he's got to get rid of the football a little bit quicker um, and I think I think the new offense will help with that because I think he might have been thinking a little bit too much last year. You mentioned all the option routes they had out there. He didn't really know where his receivers were going to be going. Um, I think now in a more structured offense that he he will know better, and I think he will be able to get rid of the football quicker. Um, and I don't think he's the he's the most uh, physically imposing quarterback. I don't think he's the fastest guy in the world. I don't think he's a great runner at all. But or I don't think he has a, a you know cannon of an arm either. But like I said, upstairs, you know, mentally, he, he's one of the best, if not the best uh, in, in the country right now, or certainly up there with guys like Carson Beck, for example. So, uh, yeah, I still think there's a lot of ways you can get better, um, especially just getting rid of the football quicker. And I think if he does that, I mean, yeah, he, he could unlock even more to his game and be a definite first round pick next year. Got you. OK, I've seen, and we'll move on right after this question. But I saw one mock draft, a couple mock drafts where he was the top pick and I think if I had to project for you, I'd say he's probably a mid first round pick for you. Would you agree with that? Yeah, probably around there right now. Yeah. Okay. So for him to be the top pick, what is outside of like, obviously we're assuming well, this is just the, under the assumption he has an average offensive line. So he's going to get sacked. We'll call it 20 times. So he's sacked 30 times less or 40 times less, whatever the number is and has better offense for him. What does he need to do to be that top player taken in the 2025 NFL draft? Uh, like I said, I just think he's got to get um, he's got to get rid of the football quicker. I think he's yeah. it's a little bit of an uphill climb for him as, as a number one overall pick because mm-hmm. he just like I said, the physical tools just aren't great with him. Um, I think they're above average at, at best, um, so that that's going to be a problem for him. I think a little bit, but. I mean, if he just shows, like, say, a guy like Bryce Young, for example, he didn't have amazing physical tools either, but he was number one overall pick because mentally he was so far ahead of, of anything we've ever seen, really, or anything we've seen in recent memory at quarterback. Now, I don't think Shador is at that level that Bryce Young was, 
Um, but I think if he gets to that level, that could be an op- a way for him to be uh, the first overall pick in the draft. So, um, yeah, I think he, he definitely has a chance to to be one of the top picks in the NFL draft. And um, obviously some of the uh, off-field stuff, some of the Twitter stuff is, is going to come back and, and interviews and stuff like that. But I, I think on field, he's certainly one of the best quarterbacks in the country. And I think uh, he's certainly going to be uh, probably one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL draft next year, too. Gotcha. If you were a gambling man, and you you had to place a bet to be it was either Shador or Travis to be the first pick. Who would you feel more comfortable pulling a little something something on? Uh, I would probably bet on Travis Hunter. I, I know oh. it's kind of rare to uh, to bet on, or really rare. I, I don't know if a corner has actually ever gone number one overall. And the last time receiver won a number one overall was back in the nineties with Keyshawn Johnson, I think. But he's both right, and he's probably the most athletic player in the country. He's going to be an absolute freak of nature. Like I said, there there are people, there are NFL people that I know that think he is a Pro Bowl caliber receiver or an all-pro caliber corner. And the fact that you can get either of those things uh, in him uh, is pretty rare. So I think there's a better chance that Travis Hunter uh, goes first overall than Shador Sanders. I think there's a really good chance we get a non-quarterback that goes number one overall because I don't think we have a Caleb Williams or a Drake May or anything like that right as of right now like we did last summer. Um, I think there's a really good chance a non-quarterback goes first overall, and I think certainly one of the top non-quarterbacks in the draft is Travis Hunter, and he's certainly one of the most unique guys that we've seen in the draft in recent memory, too. Yeah, Colorado going from one and eleven two years ago to possibly having two top ten picks um, yeah. two years later would be quite the upgrade. When we come back, we're going to be a little pessimistic. We're going to talk about our biggest concerns for the Colorado Buffaloes in twenty twenty four. We are back over here on Lockdown Buffs. I want to thank you guys for tuning in every single day, making me your first listen of the day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Everyone loves free things. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Also, make sure to tune in and one of Mr. Max Chadwick. He's always got rankings. He's got analysis. He's got it all, and he gets a little ridiculous sometimes, as we know. <laughs> Max, let's talk about concerns. Obviously, Colorado is going into a new conference where, if, you, if you're an ESPN FPI believer or not, they had, I think it was nine or 10 teams from 17 to 35. Like the, it is very close where there's, there's probably 50 different combinations you could throw out for the big 12 title game. And I'd probably be like, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, right. sure. That, that one could be it too. Like the big 12 isn't as talented as the pac 12 was last year, but it's way more deep if that makes sense. So yeah. talk to me about your biggest concern for Colorado, trying to make a bowl game, um, trying to sort of piece these things together because in, in essence, Shador is no longer going to be there after the season. Travis is gone. Shiloh has gone. This is like a big year for the program. Yeah, it's a huge year, right? I mean, this is really the year for Colorado. Now, I don't think they're going to be – I know that right now I think they're the sixth most bet on team to win it all next year in the national championship. I don't agree with that. Um, I think it's kind of burning money a little bit. But uh, I think this is certainly a year for them to make a bowl game. And, again, like people need to keep in mind, they go, oh, six and six. Like, who cares? It's like, dude, they were – like you said, they were one in 11 two years ago. Uh, six and six is a major, major improvement for that program if they can do that. So, um, yeah, I think making a bowl game would be a huge, huge uh, deal for Colorado and that program, even though the hype around them doesn't say that they should just only be going six and six. But, yeah, I think the biggest questions, right, are is the same as last year. Is, do they have the guys up front, uh, offensively and defensively? Um, I think the bigger question probably for me is the offensive line right now. Um, you're probably starting a true freshman at left tackle in Jordan Seaton, who was a former five-star recruit, so he's very, very her- heralded. But uh, we've seen – you know, rookie offensive tackles in the NFL and true freshman tackles in college football rarely come in and are immediately amazing. <clears throat> and if they are, they usually are absolute superstars. So we'll see what Jordan Seaton, excuse me, we'll see what Jordan Seaton uh, and that. But um, yeah, you mentioned they, they brought in a ton of other transfers in the offensive line. We'll see how they can gel together because I think, you know, not only do you need to be good individually, but you need to gel a, as a unit on the offensive line more so than maybe other position units. Uh, in college football. So we'll see how these all these new faces on the offensive line can gel together. Uh, and then defensive line, too, is, is another question, right? I, I love B.J. Green. I think it was a huge underrated transfer they got this offseason. Yep. Um, but there's other questions I have uh, for that defensive line and linebacker unit right now. I have no questions about quarterback. I have no questions about the receiver room, obviously. The secondary, I think, is really, really good as well. I love, love, love Preston Hodge, the Liberty corner, who's probably going to be starting slot corner this year. Uh, he was one of the best slot corners we had in college football last year. And I think he's a really underrated player that should be a stud uh, on the as a slot corner, you know, inside of, of Travis Hunter uh, for them. Uh, and then I also I'll throw out there, I like Dallin Hayden, the running back from Ohio State that got in the portal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't 
think he's a, a superstar or a star or anything like that. So I, I think the the offensive line, which helps create a lot in the run game, um, is, is a, definitely a question mark. And then I think the running backs are a little bit of a question mark for me as well. So I, I think the run game for Colorado is probably going to be a little bit of a, a question mark for me heading into the season too. Yeah, the run game is interesting because, like, you mentioned Dallin Hayden. It's like he popped off when he got opportunities as, as, at Ohio State, but when everyone was healthy, he was third or fourth on the depth chart. So it's like we know we've seen him in flashes, and so this will probably be his first and maybe only time of his college career to be the guy. Mm -hmm. And so does an offense line get enough push? Are they creating enough holes for him to run through? And then they also – they're relying on a lot of unproven commodities at, at the running back position – but I think it's a better unit than last year's, just in the sense of availability. Like Alton McCaskill was supposed to be that guy, and he just wasn't available for the team. And like, kind of showed halfway through the season, like, oh, we don't actually have a lot of running backs that we could rely on here. Like Dylan Edwards is a smaller guy, and we don't want to run him every single play. Um, Anthony Hankerson had his bright moments, but nothing too crazy. So I'm interested to see how that room looks. I would say, and you could address this. My biggest concern, and this is like a mental thing is how they handle adversity. And I brought it up yeah. like a bajillion times last year and people kept telling me, shut up. And it's like, okay, you just blew a 29-0 lead to Stanford. And it seemed like that was like the, that was like the moment their season collapsed for me. Like it was like after that, they were never the same. They lost their swagger. They lost their confidence. So like even though they could pretend or not pretend, I don't want to say they're pretending, but they could put on a, a front like, yeah, we're confident. You could just tell that as soon as something went wrong in those next few games, it was like, oh, here we go again. And so that's kind of like my biggest concern is like, say they're playing like UCF. They have UCF on the road in their first five games. Say it gets a little tough down there at the bounce house. Like, how are they going to respond to that? Say they they go to Kansas State and Arizona. They have those two games back to back. Like, what happens if you lose those two games? I want to see how they respond to adversity. Yeah, I think it's a big, that's a great point, right? And I think um, I think the mental toughness is definitely, I mean, let's put it simply, it's, it's a question mark, right? I, I don't. Uh, I don't know if they have the the leaders that you need to to get through that, right? I mean, the, you saw the stuff with uh, the, the transfer this offseason. I forgot the kid's name, uh, but the transfer this offseason and Shador Sanders was calling him trash, and teammates were calling him trash. It's just like, dude, what like what's going on? You know, in, in the in that locker room right now, um, that that's a question mark, right? And that's a that's certainly a question mark for for Shador Sanders as well as he heads into the NFL, because uh, I think. NFL teams are going to look at that and be like, you want that guy to, to lead your locker room? And I, I do like him as a as a player a lot, but I, I think the interview process is going to be huge for him. And I think Deion Sanders, right? There's been questions marks about him um, as a as a leader for that program as well. I, now, again, I'm not saying I, I necessarily agree with any of that. I think they're, they're all really, really talented, but uh, mm -hmm. there certainly are question marks, right? And I think that that's going to be a, a big thing to answer for Colorado uh, next year. And, and we'll see, you know, do they have the mental toughness, like you said, to get through and get to a bowl game? Or, you know, once something goes off the rails a little bit, will the whole season go off the rails like it did last year? Uh, or will they, you know, be able to persevere and get through that? And I guess that's definitely, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's definitely a question mark. Uh, that's more than just the uh, tangible things you can look at. I think that the intangibles for Colorado is certainly a thing that you need to keep an eye on for sure, too. Yeah, and I think to, to close on this, Deion Sanders saw as an issue because I don't know if you're familiar with their offseason training right now. They, they've been doing some Navy SEAL stuff. I'm not even kidding. They've had like Love military it. personnel like come in and they're doing like they're carrying people. They're treading water. They're doing all this crazy um, Navy SEAL training. So I feel like that's kind of like to help the mental toughness. So clearly he saw the problem, too. Um, I do think it's kind of difficult to be on the same page when you have 70 new players like they did last year. But I do think sort of they they learn from their mistakes i would assume and hopefully they can, they can build from that but yeah that was definitely a a traumatic way to end the season i think coach prime does not want that to happen again max yeah go ahead sorry no i was just gonna, i i just, the only thing i was going to say is like man it, it turned into a circus at, at times last year i think they need to tone that down right now it's time to be like okay that was just let's be a real team um and again 4 and 8 going 4 and 8 from 1 and 11 is a huge improvement i'm not saying mm -hmm. it's not you know anytime I know going four and eight is, doesn't sound great, but like you're again one and eleven the year before. So anytime you improve your win total by three is huge for a program. Um, but I think the, if you want to do that even more, if you want to do again improve by th two or three and get to six and six or seven and five, um, it's got to be a little less off field stuff for Colorado next year. And I, I know they're they're in the business of uh, of selling the program and they're doing an amazing job of that. But uh, I do think that it's got to be a little bit less of a circus. And I think if they do that, they, they certainly have a talent at a lot of positions to uh, to make a, at least make a bowl game uh, next year. Yeah, I think realistically, Colorado's like peak. Like if they if everything clicks for them, 
there's a chance that the, come October and December, they're maybe pushing for a Big 12 title spot. If everything goes wrong for them, they will be in a similar position as they were last year. It's a very like either or situation. But Max, yeah. I appreciate yeah. you for hopping on. Tell the people where they can find you, what you're working on and everything in between. Yeah, so you can find all my stuff over at uh, PFF.com, all the articles we're putting out right now. We're working on a massive college football preview magazine. Uh, we're going to preview every single Power 5 team, or Power 4 team, I should say, uh, and and then 10, I, I believe like 10 extra uh, group of five teams to keep an eye on as well. It's going to be a huge undertaking that Dalton and I are doing right now, but we're really excited about it. Uh, and then also we have our PFF college football show is dropping multiple, multiple episodes a week. Uh, covering everything in college football, previewing the season upcoming uh, pretty soon. And actually going to go record right after this right now. So check it out on YouTube, anywhere you get your podcast as well, the uh, PFF College Football Show. And if you want to follow me on X uh, or Twitter, uh, is at, at Max Chadwick CFB as well. Yeah, go follow him. He's always being ridiculous. We appreciate his ridiculousness, <laughs> though. We love him. And we appreciate you guys for tuning in every single day. Hope you guys have a great Thursday, and I will see you guys tomorrow.